Um, well, good evening, everybody, and um, welcome to our Tuesday evening Zoom, um, which uh, is going to be uh, interesting, exciting, and different this evening, I think, from, from any of the others that we've done. Um, just uh, to uh, talk you through, um, as I do every time, uh, or my one of my colleagues does every time just quickly talk you through the uh, the rules of engagement for this evening um, which hopefully um, most of you already know oh am I on mute no I'm not on mute someone sent me a message to say that I'm on mute but I don't think I am um, uh, so um, just to talk you through the rules of engagement um, we would be very grateful if you would uh, keep your videos off um, for the evening and also uh, remain muted. Um, apologies for that. We have a lot of people on the call this evening already um, on the presentation this evening. Um, and it will get a bit confusing uh, if everybody was chattering away and if we had um, lots of video showing. So um, uh, it would be great if, uh, if you keep yourself um, muted and videoed off. So thank you very much. Um, what do I need to, what do I need to tell you? Um, well, I think Pretty much everybody who's on board this evening um, is familiar with wildlife worldwide. Um, but what you may not be familiar with is that until very recently, um, we weren't um, organizing trips really in and around the UK. That's, um, that's, all, that's all relatively new. Um, and we've started to organize a lot of trips um, in and around the UK, uh, particularly in the course of the last year or so. Um, as of course the UK has been um, in those periods of, uh, of non-lockdown, uh, the UK has been one of the very few places in the world that we've been able to visit. Um, so this evening's talk um, is being given by the, uh, by the rather, rather wonderful Nick Baker. Um, Nick who has um, been visible to many of you I'm sure on various TV programmes, including things like um, Autumn Watch Unsprung and Spring Watch Unsprung and um, other series like Weird Creatures and one or two other interesting and exciting things. Um, Nick is a, um, a, a very well um, renowned uh, broadcaster and author um, and is um, he's an all rounder. Um, uh, if I if I tell you that the first time I met Nick um, was in Winchester and he um, wandered into my office with a bird on his shoulder um, and I had um, previously organised for us to uh, go to a local pub for lunch but I had to double check with them that it would be okay if Nick did in fact come with the bird on his shoulder they very kindly said it was all alright um, uh, that perhaps uh, gives you um, a bit of a uh, bit of the measure of Nick. Um, Nick is a great friend. He um, was uh, with us at our uh, Borneo Festival of Wildlife a couple of years ago. We had great fun there. Um, Nick is very much um, a, a chap who, who knows about um, all sorts of unusual things, um, uh, insects um, and uh, some of the things which are perhaps uh, less, um, how should we put it, kind of less, less in your face than um, uh, the big cuddly stuff, though um, I know for sure he likes all of that stuff as well. Um, so Nick, um, you're not visible at the moment, but I know that you're there because I can see you on the call and you're muted at the minute. So I'm going to ask you to unmute um, and then to uh, and to start your video. Um, uh, Nick did tell me a couple of minutes ago before I let you all in, I shouldn't panic um, if he doesn't appear. Um, uh, but that's because he's changing the battery in his camera um, and uh, and maybe he's changed the battery in his camera now I don't really know um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he has changed the battery in his camera fantastic <laughs> so you are actually there um, actually this is marvelous. <laughs> um, Nick remind me what was it you had on your shoulder when we met was it a crow or was it a, it was a rook wasn't it it was a jackdaw oh, it, it was a, a jackdaw, jackdaw. Right. You know, that was Steve the jackdaw who was Steve. a um, uh, a, a, a quite a regular fixture um, for the lectures. As a fellow of natural history at Winchester College, I was, um, I couldn't be parted from this baby bird, so he just sat with me all the time. Um, 
Whatever happened to him? I know he had a nice lunch with us over the road. Yeah, it was a it's sad awesome. story in the end. Ultimately, it was one of those, it was either a life of complete captivity or an element of freedom in the garden. Um, and he'd had a fairly, you know, he'd, he'd extended his life by several months because he would have definitely perished in the wild. And um, he had unfortunately got a broken wing that never set oh. right. So, uh, so he would flap around in the garden, but he was always vulnerable. And uh, we suspect some local corvids um, of another species um, finished him off but, uh, but but while we had him he was brilliant he changed a lot of people's attitudes to um, those blackbirds up there um, most people don't realize how smart and how intelligent they are and how much of a personality each bird is they're all very very different yeah. in their, in their yeah. characters but anyway he was a jackdaw that was steve <laughs> that was steve the jackdaw well he certainly turned a few heads in the pub if i don't if i remember rightly so, uh, Nick, look, over to you, mate. I'll, uh, I'll leave, you, leave you to chat away. As everybody knows, but just a reminder, um, we have a chat facility. If you're using a computer or a laptop, the chat should appear at the bottom of your screen. If you're on a mobile device, the chat facility, I think I'm right in saying, appears at the top. Please do feel free, free to fire over any questions you'd like me to, um, to pose to Nick at the end, as difficult as possible, because uh, I know he likes a challenge. Um, um, the messages will come to me. I can see one or two people have already started sending messages over, which is absolutely super, but please feel free to ask questions. Nick, over to you, and, um, and then we'll have Q&A at the end, and I'll, I'll, I'll be here if there's any disasters. I'm not quite sure what I'll do, but anyway, if there are, I'll be around. It'll all go smoothly. What yes, possibly I'm sure it will. Exactly. What could possibly go wrong? It's all technology. <laughs> Marvellous. Um, lovely. All right, Nick, over to you. Brilliant. Cheers for that, Chris. Thank you very much. Um, Oh, well, welcome everybody. Oh, hang on. It's not, um, I'm trying to, hang on. There we go. Um, welcome everybody. Uh, thanks so much for, for joining us. I'm a little, I'm, 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 I'm not done one of these uh, before, certainly not for wildlife worldwide. So um, I'm not familiar with uh, my, my audience in this case. So um, bear with me. I'm just here really to tell you a little bit about my patch. Ultimately, we will be doing um, uh, guided trips. That, uh, in fact, we'll do as many as, as you like, basically. If, you, if they fill up, we'll make some more. So we're going to be doing guided trips um, to Dartmoor um, this year. We're going to start this year. We're supposed to have started last year, but uh, uh, well, let's not talk about last year, right? So I'm going to show you around my patch, Dartmoor. Early 90s, I first came to Dartmoor. Now, Dartmoor, for a young naturalist who grew up in East Sussex, was a legendary place, especially if you were into, uh, into butterflies. But uh, Dartmoor is one of two national parks that we've got in Devon. We've got Exmoor and uh, up north, uh, which actually overlaps into Somerset. But Dartmoor is that big knobbly bit right in the middle of, uh, of Devon there, sort of slightly towards the south. Um, and it's big. It's 368 square miles of what is actually compared to all the other land around the place, it is fairly um, uh, nutrient poor upland. It is the only upland in the south of Britain. Um, and for that, it has lots of unique flavors. Now, um, it's famous for these big sweeping landscapes, the big moorlands, the, the tors made of granite, these, these um, volcanic um, extrusions that have come up through the, uh, the country rock at some point millions of years ago. But there's so much more to Dartmoor than piles of rocks on tops of hills um, and, and Dartmoor ponies, which of course are the other famous resident. And, and having lived here, um, and I'm always encountering people that they, 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 they'll go for long yomps across these effectively um, denuded landscapes and, uh, and they miss all the good stuff. So I'm gonna give you a quick whiz round uh, some of the good stuff, some of my favorite bits. It's by no means comprehensive. There is loads of stuff that I won't mention in this talk. And if there's anything I've missed or you wanna talk about or ask questions about, feel free to ask questions at the end. So it was this insect that brought me to Dartmoor. Well, technically speaking, it brought me to Exeter first. I got bad uh, careers advice as a kid. Um, and they said all universities, the biology course that you need to take, is they're all the same. So choose the one you want to go to. So I chose uh, Exeter because there was Dartmoor and Exmoor not far away, national parks. And what was important for me for these national parks is that they held populations of butterflies that either had gone extinct in East Sussex, where I grew up, or would going extinct. And this one in particular, I watched go extinct as a child. My, my diaries see this thing petering out. And this is the high brown fertility. It's probably, arguably, up there with the Duke of Burgundy, um, the most threatened butterfly 
in Britain. Um, we're closest to losing this one. So it's a, it is a very special insect. And uh, I went to Dartmoor because it was there. Um, and I got the job uh, on graduating, or actually not on graduating, if, I, if I'm honest, I had a year on the dole first because nobody wants to employ an entomologist. Um, but after that year, I finally got my first job. Um, and my first job was a dream job. It was chasing high brown fritillaries around Dartmoor. And I had to camp on the, um, on, on the moor because I don't have or didn't have a car in those days. So I'd cycle up from Exeter with my tent and I'd camp either in the, uh, in the dark valley um, or I would um, camp in a farmer's field. So, or a barn even when the weather got really nasty. So this was the butterfly that started it all um, and started my love affair with everything Dartmoor. Um, so I spent a long time um, looking for the butterflies and, um, and the caterpillar itself. Oh gosh, why is it not? Hang on, there we are. And the caterpillar which feeds on um, violets. It looks very much like the bracken um, that coat many of the slopes of, of Dartmoor. Um, and just, I'm just going to show you a little bit of a trip down memory lane because um, I'm just to prove the point. On leaving university, I didn't look like I look now. Um, I had lots of the trappings of the classic student, but I found this clip the other day. I thought you might be interested in seeing it. Oh, no, that's the caterpillar. Hang on, here comes the clip. One in there somewhere. Ugh, there is. Another butterfly is trapped, ready for identification, tagging and recording. Staff from English Nature have been running around Dartmoor for the past few weeks as part of a three-year survey into the dwindling habitat of the elusive high brown fritillary. We're trying to find out exactly what bracken it likes and the density of the bracken. Uh, we're trying to find out um, which violet plants, which of the food are selected for egg laying. Um, and we're trying to find out a bit about the size of the populations and whether they are discrete little populations or whether they're all part of a big population. Whether this butterfly actually flies across the moors to other sites as well. This one's going to be 254 yeah. if you put those on. Okay. Well, this butterfly, um, no one can catch this, it's actually fully protected by law um, and we have a license to um, do timber this now. It lends itself well for numbering, it has these rows of this on the wing. So we'll mark this at 234. So I'm going to put a red spot in the 200. It's 10, 20, 30, and one, two, three, four. And that is now an individual butterfly in marks, so and we'll record it again if we catch it. There you are, so that's my first job, defacing butterflies. Sacrilege, I know, but uh, it is all a very important part of understanding how these butterflies move around on the moors. Um, and because of that, I really did get to know the place intimately. Um, and sadly, I mean, it's disappeared from lots of sites, even since those days. Um, we don't know quite why. Habitats changing, maybe um, climate change or uh, nitrification, so atmospheric nitrogen landing on the and changing the um, uh, the vegetation structure. We don't really know. Um, it's a, a peculiar butterfly. Um, it's still we do still find it on some sites. It's still got some of its stronghold sites um, um, here. Um, so yeah, if we if we run trips at the right time of year, or well, we will be running trips at the right time of year. But if you're on one of those trips, we may well see high brown fritillaries. If we do some early trips, maybe next year, we may well find the caterpillars as well. So, but it's not just high browns. We've got loads of fritillaries. We've got well, nearly all of them actually. We've got we've got nearly got a full set. So um, later on in the summer, well, we've got dark green, which isn't there in that picture, but um, that lovely big butterfly on the left there. We've got the uh, the silver washed. And then we've got the, um, the, the pearl bordered, the small pearl bordered and the marsh fritillary in the bottom left. These are all classic um, fritillaries, all of which feed on violets, except for the marsh fritillary, which, uh, which feeds on devil's bit scabious. But uh, a cracking bunch of butterflies and I've probably much worked on most of them. Silver wash fritillary, incidentally, um, is probably what, even though it's, it's not the one I worked on, it is the, probably one of my favourite. It reminds me of a tropical butterfly, the way it glides around. It has the most incredible courtship where the, the male does a loop the loop around the female as she's flying horizontally. He will overtake her and drop down in front of her, then go up in front, go up behind her and do it again. And all the time he'll be sprinkling her with his, uh, his perfume scales off his wings. Um, and this, I believe, is a male. Yes, you can see the stripes on the forewings there are what you call sex brands. Uh, I know it's possibly a, um, um, a little early on a Tuesday evening to be talking about such things, but they're quite racy insects. Um, and they've got that lovely, can't really see it in this shot, but the, the underside of the hind wing has a, a lovely wash of almost uh, pearlescent silver, um, hence its name, the, uh, the silver washed fritillary. So yeah, cracking insects. 
Um, we've also got, um, so those, are, those are insects live in the, in the many wooded valleys. Now we have, I think, nine major rivers that start up on the plateaus of Dartmoor. Think of it like a sponge on your draining board. Um, it, you know, a nice saturated sponge, you put it there and it slowly releases water. So it's a big sponge of sphagnum moss and peat that sits right at the top and it slowly releases water all year through these amazing fast flowing high energy rivers. Um, this one's the River Teen. This is, uh, if you know, you can just about see Castle Drogo there on the, the right hand side of the, uh, the middle of that shop there. Um, but this is the, this is the uh, Drogo uh, Gorge, um, which cuts its way through the, uh, the metamorphic aureole of, um, of uh, Dartmoor. Uh, also, incidentally, a, a habitat for a very rare ground beetle, uh, Kuglin's um, green clock or Kuglin's ground beetle um, as well. So all possibilities. And um, now these wooded valleys are full of some pretty awesome trees. A lot of them, actually, if you if I go back to that side, you can see on the left hand side, you can see tracks in the wood on the left hand side of the uh, valley there. Technically speaking, of course, that's known as the right hand side of the valley. If you've ever worked on rivers, um, you always uh, name the, um, the sides of a valley uh, as if you're looking downstream. So the, the river's flowing towards you in this in this shot. So the right hand side of the valley, the right bank of the river has those tracks on those are old um, charcoal cutters tracks. So if you know this part of the of the world, all this ancient, well it's not ancient, all this, well it is ancient, it's, it's always had woodland on it, it's just never, and it's never been improved, but it was all cut down at different times. So all this growth that you can see there is the same age, it's all oak and ash, um, rapidly becoming just oak, and um, yeah, all those old charcoal cutters um, tracks and at the end of the elbow of each one of those tracks is a big flat stage where they used to put the uh, the charcoal kilns. So at once upon a time, in fact, there's photos of this valley where there's, it's almost denuded, no trees at all. Um, I just thought I'd add that. But there are still lots of big old trees. The deer parks around and about have some um, absolute crackers. If anyone watched any of my uh, um, original uh, autumn watch pieces, actually, um, I did a piece on my favourite ash trees up in my local deer park, which is one of the sites we will be going to as well, home to all three British woodpeckers, um, greater, lesser spotted and green woodpecker. Um, these ancient woodlands uh, where they exist are home to all sorts of things. Here's a nocturnal bat. We'll certainly be able to do a lot of bat detecting. I do a little bit of that. I like my bats. I'm not a bat. Um, aficionado I, I still don't i might have by the time you book on by the time we're all released from this uh, situation we're finding ourselves in i might have a bat license so i might be able to show you these things but that's a nocturne that's britain's biggest bat um and that was part of a uh, a license box uh, checking operation but uh, we'll certainly see nocturnes uh, often flying around in the summer we'll see them flying around with the uh, the swifts and the hirundines the swallows and the martins um, they're one of the few bats you can see quite regularly in daylight, um, certainly in the shorter night, um, sorry, the longest days of the year means there's less night for them to fly in, so they are forced into action a bit earlier. Um, these uh, river valleys, of course, at the bottom still have the river in them. The rivers that crafted them originally um, are, are full of life. Now, they're not the most diverse rivers in the world. There's lots of stuff in there. We have quite nutrient poor uh, waters, so there's, but there's lots of, um, lots of specialist insects, lots of, uh, lots of mayflies. There's some specialised dragonflies and damselflies, uh, lots of crustaceans, and it supports a kind of a, an interesting assortment of fish. Uh, the most famous, of course, are the trout and salmon runs. We have um, really, it's a reasonably good um, uh, salmon river. Uh, we have sea trout and, and well, I, I would say sea trout and brown trout. Actually, brown trout is sea trout. It's the same thing. Uh, what we call brown trout is a trout that stays in the river. A sea trout is um, anadromous, which, uh, or anadromous, depending on how you want to pronounce it, where do you want to put the emphasis. Um, they migrate to the sea just like a salmon. But any trout, any brown trout can become a sea trout. So certainly if they're growing up um, and there's a, the theory goes, if there's a shortage of forage and not enough food for them, they will, they will bail out and go down to the sea and become sea trout. So, uh, um, and you can see that most times of the year, you'll see trout and salmon sitting in very specific pools along the river. Um, and of course, when you've got trout and salmon, uh, which are, they are declining, but they are um, doing okay. My current job or my one of my current jobs is actually um, working on, as a, on a restoration project um, for my local river. Um, and the idea is to get more salmon back. 
Uh, incidentally, this picture I borrowed from uh, Jack Perks, who's a fabulous underwater photographer, a friend of mine. Um, I'm sure he won't mind, but I thought I'd better give him a credit. Um, loads of great insects. Another a classic, um, certainly a, I think, I always think of it as a classic upland species, but you get them in the lowlands as well. Um, one of our biggest dragonflies, um, Cordula gaster boltonii, the gold ringed dragonfly. We'll see those zooming around um, the, uh, the slopes of these wooded valleys um, throughout the summer months. Um, um, and they are they are stunning. They're stunning insects. This one um, is um, I think must have just emerged. Actually, it's got pretty damaged wings. It might have been emerged and then bashed by a bird. I don't know. But um, they are monstrous insects. They're brilliant, and their larvae are quite uh, commonly found um, in the rivers. And I spend a lot of time jumping in the rivers, dipping into the rivers. I even do a bit of river snorkeling. I'm not sure if our health and safety will allow that, but um, I always think you don't really get to know a river until you stuck your head underneath the surface. Um, uh, one of my favourite birds. Um, we're here. We'll see about the the the, the other favourite uh, a little bit later on. But uh, uh, the dipper, the water oozel, as we call it, or its old English name. Um, these rivers support really good numbers of dipper, and uh, I could spend an entire, well, I could spend hours watching these things fishing. They are just such a surprising bird. Uh, really good populations of dipper, um, and uh, and a real specialist um, of these upland uh, streams that we have. Um, oh, our dip of leaves the shot in a very different way. Now, another uh, a resident of our, uh, our wooded river valleys, particularly the ancient river valleys and certainly the more humid ones on the, uh, uh, the east of Dartmoor, um, are, is this guy. This one here, this is um, probably our rarest um, and largest ground beetle. Now, it is known as the blue ground beetle, uh, Carabus intricatus, and I think it is a stunner. It is one of the legendary beasts of Dartmoor that nobody sees because you have to go poking around um, their woodland habitat at night during the summer. Um, and obviously, if we do go out on, if you do come and, uh, and join me on any of these experiences, that will be certainly some one of the target species um, if we're there in the right month. So uh, um, yeah, the, the summer trips are, are particularly good. And there's nothing more magical, even if beetles aren't your thing, um, there's nothing more magical than hanging out in a woodland um, where these things live, because there's loads of other cool things going on. The, the, the branches are, are covered in mosses and epiphytic ferns. It's like being in a rainforest. And there's something about the smell of that, the, 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 the rotting leaf mold and, and just, it's, it's the place of fairies um, without getting carried away. Now, the other thing that lives in those woods, of course, are, it may not be your cup of tea, but I decided to add it in because it's all part of what we call biodiversity, which means every single species, whether it's a, I don't know, whether it's a cuckoo or a salmon, um, a, a red deer, of course, we've got those as well. I didn't put any slides in, I forgot to put the deer slides in, anyway, um, or, or a slug, they all count as one. They're all relevant, they all uh, have their own stories to tell. So part of what I like to do when I, when I take people around my, uh, my favourite places is tell the stories that are underlying the surface, the ones that the, 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 the workers that um, Chris introduced me as someone who likes the weird stuff. Um, I don't think they're that weird. I just think they need a bit of explaining. They just need a little, you should just you need to shed some of your preconceived ideas and step into their world and see the world through their eyes or tentacles or whatever they've got. Um, and this is actually a really cool slug. This is the ash black slug, which is uh, the longest slug in the world, I believe. I'm correct in saying certainly the biggest in the UK. Um, they can get to nearly a foot long, some of these things. Um, and this was in a woodland um, uh, on the Bovey. And this one um, is also the chief uh, prey of the blue ground beetle. So um, they, so you go looking for blue ground beetle later, well, uh, yeah, late at night, um, and you go looking for them, leaving the leaf mold on the at the bottom of the wood and heading up the trees. So they spend a lot of their time hunting in the trees. Um, when they do find a slug, oops, hang on, um, they do. Oh, where's the picture? They are, do find the, the, the slug. They use those incredible uh, tin snips of mandibles um, to, uh, to 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 slice it up into slug steaks, I guess. But uh, yeah, really, really cool pair of animals, uh, both really rarely seen um, yet. If you know where to look, uh, you can find them. And even if the beetle isn't your thing, there's a gin named after it. And I just have to put this one in because this is lockdown project um, the mo that I'm most proud of last year. Um, a local uh, gin distillery, and they are local, they're literally the next village down the river from me here. Um, 
are famous for making a really nice gin called Papillon, which is um, uh, it's a gin made out of local botanicals from the upper moor. So there's lots of gorse flower in it and, and lots of other uh, local botanicals. Um, and uh, a percentage of the profits of that company go of, of each sale of the, of the Papillon bot, uh, gin goes towards Butterfly Conservation's Moorland Butterfly Project, which helps look after the fritillary butterflies that I've already mentioned. Now this year or last year, we set about making a limited edition uh, made out of woodland botanicals. So there's no flowers in this one, or certainly very few. It has hazelnuts in it, um, has a very, very different taste. I'm not even a gin drinker, but I like this one. And two pounds for every sale goes towards the conservation of the blue ground beetle. Now, the chances are that we'll be, a, we'll be meeting up with, um, with the company. Maybe we can even have a little peek around the distillery. I don't know, uh, but we can certainly try um, either of the gins. So if you're gins your thing and you like drinking for conservation, I'm your man. Anyway, let's talk about the hedges. There's a loads of habitats. I've sort of tried to split this talk up into a little bit about habitats. Um, Devon has loads of hedges, right? We are the most hedgy uh, county, if that's a word, in the UK. 330,000 miles, apparently. I find that hard to believe, but anyway, it's a lot of hedges. Um, and over a quarter of those are ancient hedges over 800 years old. So Dartmoor has a really good selection of hedges. Every image you see looking out from the moor, as this one is, um, a rather cute sheep in the foreground there as well. I'm not a massive sheep fan, but I quite like that one. Um, you can see, look at those fields. They're all, uh, they, they, they've still got their hedges. They, they didn't get, um, because the soil is generally so poor here and also we were so far away from the industrial centres that actually the fields got left behind a little bit here. In fact, we're a little bit behind. In fact, we're so far behind, we're ahead of the game. So we've still got intact hedges here. Um, maybe not quite as old as Cornwall, but we're up, we're up close. I think some of the Cornish hedges are the oldest ones ever recorded. But those hedges are made more of stone. So then you start sliding the definition of what a hedge is. But anyway, um, they're all good for wildlife. Um, a lot of our uh, hedges, um, we have uh, sections of wall as well. We have some of the best stone walls, I think, in the... Uh, in the country um, and they all provide these amazing habitats for lots of things so when you've got a stone wall you create a microclimate uh, the flowers um, uh, often if it's unimproved they're very rich flowers you get these lovely hot pockets developing um, and they're really good for insects this one here is one of the most charismatic insects you'll see early on in the year this is a bloody nosed beetle um, so called because um, they when disturbed they will vomit up um, a well, it's actually hemolymph, it's actually the blood. Um, they will, they will, um, <laughs> they will uh, reflex bleed from glands around their mouth. A droplet of red liquid, which is, if you want to just taste it, just dip it, dip it, just dab a little bit on your tongue, you will never do it again. You'll realise just how, why these animals are bold as brass. They walk about during the day and any insect eating bird you would think would want to eat that. But until you realise just how unpleasant they are to eat, um, uh, you, you don't realise. But that's, there's a story there, and they're, they're wonderful insects. This is a male. You can tell he's a male because he's got big boots on. Uh, the males have big, uh, big um, tarsi, big expanded tarsi on their front feet, as those big slippers with the, uh, the orange bristles or the hairs, you can just about see there. And they use those to grip onto the female's back. Uh, the grubs are just as fascinating. That's one of the, uh, the larvae. They feed on bed straws. Um, this one's on a plant that my dad used to call sticky willy. But every time I say that, um, everyone sniggers. Um, but uh, sticky willy or cleavers, uh, goose grass is another one, uh, sticky balls, I've heard it called all sorts of things, but, uh, but that's, the, that's what the larvae look like, and bizarre quilted caterpillars, um, that's a slightly better shot there. Um, and that orange thing on his bum is a pigidium, by the way. It's his little extra grippy, um, like a little pro leg that sticks on the back there. Um, now, there's another beetle that you also find. I often get mixed up for bloody nose beetles because they come out about the same time of year and you see them bumbling around in the same sort of places. Nice, warm areas with a little bit of bare soil, uh, lots of flowers. Um, and this one here is the oil beetle. Um, this is the violet oil beetle. It's one of five species of oil beetle we have in the UK. We have a couple of the other species here on Dartmoor as well, but this is the one you're most likely to see. Um, this is a big fat female. Um, she's like a long, which always reminds me of a, um, I don't know, a, a, fat, um, a fat gentleman in a very tight waistcoat. But uh, her abdomen is absolutely packed with thousands upon thousands of tiny eggs. Um, I can tell she's a female, though, because her antennae are straight. Uh, the male, um, and here's a male, 
Um, they have wonky antennae, they've got a little kink in their antennae. Um, so this is a male um, doing what they do most of the time, which is feed on celandines. Um, incidentally, this, this male has a, a midge feeding on his blood. If you go down, the, down his abdomen, about halfway, well, towards the, the rear third, there's a little midge. Now midges are, um, they actually uh, seek out the, um, the toxins, the chemicals within the blood, because these equally are distasteful. Um, they are a member of the oil beetle family, which of course uh, includes the blister beetles, which you might or might not, might know, uh, might not know, um, as the, the, the insect family that produces Spanish fly. Spanish fly isn't uh, a fly, it's produced by the blister beetles. Um, uh, I won't tell you what you can do with Spanish fly if you, if you know what I'm talking about, brilliant, if not, Google it. Um, but then the most important thing about um, um, these beetles, other than their cultural history with humans, is that um, they are feed on leaves, but they, they will lay eggs in, um, once they've mated, they'll lay eggs in, in little um, batches in the ground, thousands of eggs at a time. And when they hatch, they hatch out into these tiny little creatures you can see in the, in the flowery box below. Those are triangulans. Um, and these little larvae don't do anything. They literally, they, they, they molt, um, they, they hatch, they crawl, they molt, they crawl straight up into a flower and they sit there. And when a bee comes by, they literally reach up with their three hooked, hence the name triangulan, their three hooked um, legs and grip onto the bee and get carried back to the bee's nest. Now, most of these get on the wrong bee or the wrong fly and they perish. But some of them will get on bees of the Andrina, the, the flower bee family, and they'll get taken back to these solitary bee nests. And when they're deposited in the right bee species nest, uh, when the bee finally moves on, having um, su supplied her cells with uh, pollen and nectar um, and laid an egg, um, these little larvae play havoc and they eat the lot and then they pupate and then they emerge the following year. So, um, but they go through several molts um, um, as larvae and they change. So the first molt is these really active things called triangulans and then they molt into a much more typical beetle larva, more like a grub um, uh, later on when they're inside the, the nest of their host. So kind of something called um, hypermetamorphism, morphosism. So it's... Um, a really, uh, really unusual feature of these insects. So very, very cool. Oh, I didn't realise it's a video, not a picture. There you are. Um, you can see them eating. Um, <laughs> not that's much better than the photo, but it's a bit more interesting, eh? So uh, yeah, we'll uh, almost certainly see those. If you if you come on some of the earlier trips, you'll almost certainly see those. But saying that, um, we can pick up uh, bloody nose beetles almost any time. But equally, they are they use the same trick as the bloody nose beetle, which is they contain toxins, and you don't have to be warn carry warning colours to be um, uh, to be protected and, and to, by, by, to send a message to your potential predators. You can equally um, have the um, just being black and bold is just as good as warning. Here's a close up of the triangulans, um, very active, always twitching, running up and down, sitting there with their their legs open, <laughs> waiting for a bee to come down. Um, these flowery places are full of all sorts of beautiful things. I just put this one in because it's one of my favourites. You'll see all sorts of spiders. You might be lucky enough. Some of the sites, some of the flower-rich sites are also home to uh, glowworms. They're not hugely common on Dartmoor, but we still have quite a lot of um, rough grassland. They're particularly common around the uh, uh, the edges of the moor where we've got rough uh, calcareous grasslands where the uh, uh, the ground isn't as, as acidic, which is also good for snails, which is the prey of our glowworm, and that's a, a glowworm larva. Um, loads of more butterfly species. We've got um, uh, dingy skippers, grizzle skippers, green hair streaks, brown hair streaks. We've got a good selection of reptiles as well. We don't have smooth snakes, but we do have adder. We've got grass snakes, um, plenty of slow worms and common lizards. They love the toasty open areas um of the moor they love the banks and the walls where they, they there's plenty of sun traps and loads of cracks and crevices where they can uh, squirrel themselves away um so this is a female instead we found this female and we uh, we were um um photographing her and she gave birth right in front of us so we have <laughs> all her brand new babies right there so they uh, they don't lay eggs they actually give birth to uh, to live young and there's a that's that wonderful um, facial expression. What you can't see there, and it's another one of those hidden layers of life, which makes for, um, well, just makes life really interesting. You're never bored when you're into all these things, but uh, inside that mouth is a set of teeth 
um, and I do have a picture, but I don't have it with me. I didn't load it on, unfortunately. Um, there's a, a set of jaws in there with teeth like a great white shark. They're big and sharp and, and, foot and backward pointing, and they are perfect. They're also a slug muncher, a little bit like our uh, blue ground beetle. If nothing else, you're learning something about Dartmoor. We have a lot of slugs, or as we confusingly call them in the Devonshire dialect, snails. Uh, slugs and snails are called snails um, in, in old uh, Devonish. Um, and I think I did mention common lizards. Now, if none of, if, 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 even if it's the natural history isn't your thing, there's plenty of interest at so many other levels as well. So it's got more archaeological sites, I think, than any highest density of archaeological uh, historic sites than I think anywhere else in the UK. Certainly, we've got more um, stone circles in better state repair than anywhere else. We've got loads of uh, stone rows. Um, some of them are Bronze Age. Some of them potentially predate those. Um, we have got the longest stone row, I believe, as well on the moor. So we've got we've got a good selection. If you're into ancient artifacts in the landscape, we've got them too. So this one here is uh, oh gosh, which one's that? That Scorrel uh, Stone Circle, uh, not a million miles away from where I'm sitting right now. And um, what's wonderful, this is one of my favourite places. I, uh, not that I'm, I'm not a druid, um, I'm not a druid in any way, but I like coming up here uh, midsummer um, and you have a snipe drumming over that scene in the background there. And there's nothing more magical in the summer than an evening sunsetter with your back against one of these ancient stones, watching the sun going down, listening to snipe drumming. Nothing like it. If you're lucky, you get a cuckoo going off behind you as well. Um, so yeah, really cool things. Loads of old clapper bridges, if you like them. Lots of old clapper bridges. It's my daughter giving a very uh, a victorious sign because she's found it. Um, we looked for this bridge for a little while. This is Upper Teen Head, um, which is a an ancient abandoned farmstead. Uh, there's loads of um, oh gosh, I don't really want that. It does at the video. I've got as a photo I loaded. Loads of uh, interesting features. Leets are really good. Loads of leets everywhere. If you like a leet, one of those amazing optical illusions that sort of seem to uh, channel water uh, around the landscape. Now, really, a lot of Dartmoor is a post-industrial landscape. So leets are very much part of uh, driving the mills and the, gr the grindstones and uh, all around the moor. So very important for, for farming in, in, historically. We've got lots of ancient cairns. This is my daughter sitting in one that's been um, actually uh, hollowed out. It's been excavated at some point. Um, but yeah, there's lots of amazing cans. You just got to imagine who put them there, how much effort. Every single one of those stones has been carried up the hill and placed there, and they are massive. So you can just sit there and wonder about those for hours on end. Um, this is Grey Weathers, one of the big stone circles. It's a double stone circle, this one. Um, really, really lovely. Um, uh, and, and we've got kists, which are burial chambers. That's one on the left there. We've got medieval farmsteads at the bottom there. They've still got these amazing, that one's actually got some what you call bee bowls in there. So they've got these little chambers in the wall that they used to keep the bee hives in. And uh, all these features are still here in reasonable state of preservation. And then we've got more um, sort of certainly 19th century um, um, activities as well. So there was a lot of quarrying and tin mining. The quarry um, at the top there um, is Foggintor Quarry, which was um, where the stone for uh, most of London came from. Um, but it's also where London Bridge uh, Mark I came from. So the London Bridge that is now in, um, in Arizona, that was bought by the American millionaire um, and shipped out there um, after it started falling down, um, all the stone came from here. And in fact, when they wanted uh, replacement corbels, um, they actually requarried it in order to get it from the original location. So it's a really interesting history. If you're into uh, your archaeology, uh, both modern and ancient, it's all there. And if you like gateposts, I'm a bit nerdy about a gatepost. Um, there's some cracking gateposts. Look at this. Uh, you don't see these uh, very often, but these are the old um, uh, the old style gateposts. You can almost feel the... Uh, um, the, the the plank of wood that uh, would have sl slotted into there. You can sort of slides in horizontally, then drops down vertically. Um, and uh, I like a good gate post, so uh, we'll always stop to have a look at a gate post. But as well as all the man-made stuff, there's also the, the the tours. I know I sort of skipped over them early on, but they are incredible. Each one tells a story of a weathering process 
each one has a character all of its own some have very fine grained granite some are very coarse some have lots of feldspars in them depending on how they cooled and where they were in the earth's bowels uh, when they were formed and of course there was all that's left these huge extrusions that would have stuck up through the um through the, uh, the, 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 the country soil or the country rock. Um, and this one's a famous one. This is known as Bowman's Nose, um, which is one of the more spectacular ones. It's just the most peculiar thing. And if you look at it carefully with a little bit of artistic license, you can see, you can see Bowman and you can see his nose. He's standing there and he's looking off to the left. Um, uh, oof, got a great mist tour, I think, that one. Um, but these um, these rocky formations are absolutely fabulous. This one's one of my favourite. This is as far as you can get from a road in the south of England. This is um, Fir Tor. Uh, again, situated right in the middle of the, the main uh, open moor. So lots of um, acidic grassland surrounded by bogs and mires and uh, not many trees up there. Incidentally, I did find a grey squirrel up there, so uh, that's quite a, quite an achievement for a grey squirrel. It's also um, home because we tend to think of badgers as being the sort of creature that you find in the uh, in the lowlands and the wooded valleys around, but you get badgers everywhere, and uh, there's even a badger set um, right on the top of the moor up at Fir Tor as well. So they're absolutely everywhere. Um, I took this the other day actually. I was out listening for skylarks and. Uh, um, I found some badger footprints while I was out there. I just sort of bung them in because they look quite cool. Um, oh, and that's one of my badgers. Um, it comes to the door every day. Um, I'm not sure I'll be sharing my garden with my visitors um, when we come down, but uh, there's plenty of those. If badgers are your thing, I've got uh, I've got badgers for you. Um, so these guys, there's a lot of uh, grazing on the moor. It's famous, obviously, for its uh, unfenced um, common land. So um, this is a Scottish blackface um, and this is a pure Dartmoor pony. They do a lot of good work, um, more so the ponies and the cattle than the sheep. The sheep can actually cause quite a lot. They can actually cause some problems. But uh, when it's back, when the grazing's right, you get a fantastic habitat for all sorts of creatures. Uh, one of my favorite beetles, this is, um, um, this is the Minotaur beetle. Um, which is a, a, one of the dung beetles. Um, this is a male. You can tell he's got the spines on his, uh, um, on his prothorax there. Uh, in the summer, we'll get uh, good numbers of uh, tiger beetle. They love the sandier soil. And we'll go looking for the larvae that live in little holes in the footpaths. Um, but they're really cool insects. Again, easy to miss because they're not very big. But when you see them eyeball to eyeball, the colours are exquisite. The, uh, the metallic nature of them is awesome. Um, in the spring, you might be lucky enough to see uh, Britain's only silk moth. This is the emperor moth. This is a female emperor moth. And throughout the rest of the summer, you can pick up the caterpillars, the larvae, which change colour every time they melt their skin. Um, and they feed up on the, on the bilberry and the heather um, up on the top of the moor. And of course, then provide food for a whole range of species, particularly favoured by cuckoos. The caterpillars are anyway. And the moths themselves are... Uh, often uh, preyed upon by hobby, um, that bird of prey, that agile bird of prey that snatches them out of the air and feeds them on the wing. Um, the cuckoos we mentioned, um, we hear a lot about declines in cuckoos all over all over the UK, but Dartmoor is a bit of a bubble. Um, whereas on the lowlands, um, the summers have often gone quiet. So the cuckoos just aren't there. The gen uh, or the gens, which um, is the sort of, it's not really a race, but it's a, um, a, a, a split in the population that preys um, or parasitizes the nests of birds uh, such as um, uh, dunnocks seems to have vanished from the lowlands. We don't quite understand because dunnocks seem to be doing okay. But up on the moor, the gens that actually um, parasitizes pipits, uh, as in meadow pipits, is doing really well. Unfortunately, so is the pipit. So uh, it's one of the best places to see cuckoos. So if you've not seen a cuckoo, a trip to Dartmoor in May and June in the right spots, you will see and hear cuckoos of both sexes doing all their cooking and ooing, um, as well as all the other brilliant chortly noises that they make when they're courting. Um, and with a bit of luck, you might even see a bit of, um, a bit of pipit action as well, where they, they parasitise the nest. Um, and it's not un unheard of to... Uh, um, if you spend enough time, you can find the pipit nest and you can actually find the cuckoo nest, uh, cuckoo egg in them. But, uh, but they're one of our more famous um, uh, migrants. Um, this was a, uh, a bird that was, um, he's actually alive, it doesn't look alive, it's got a puppet. Um, but these were part of the BTO study that um, um, in the, some of its earlier years, 
So this was a cuckoo called um, called Wirtle, which is a local dialect name for what we know in Scotland as Blaybury, but uh, everywhere else as Bilberry, one of our um, vaccinium species, one of the um, uh, blueberry family. Very, very good eating, by the way. It used to be a bit of a, uh, um, um, a thing for people to travel down from London, a bit of a local industry. Uh, they travel down from London uh, to collect the bilberries or whortleberries and take them back to turn into jam. Uh, but these open grasslands grazed to perfection by, um, by large herbivores like the ponies and cattle produce this great mixture of habitats complete with all the, all the granite and all those crevices in the walls. It makes it the perfect spot for other migrants, not just the cuckoos, but you have things um, like wheat here. Uh, I can spend all afternoon watching wheat ears. They are fabulously interesting birds, got loads of different calls and songs, loads of different postures and body language. Um, and they are, really are the sound of uh, the summer. I'll be expecting my first wheat ears uh, back on the moor any day now, actually. Uh, they're one of the earliest arrivals. I call them sentinels of spring up here on the moor. We also get the uh, increasingly rare wind chat, uh, wind being a name for gorse. They like to be associated with low clumps of gorse. Um, and we have plenty of those as well, as well as stone chats, which are a resident bird. They don't seem to go anywhere. Uh, skylarks, we've got a good health population of skylarks up here. Um, meadow pipits, we've mentioned them already. That's the chief host of our cuckoo. They're easy to ignore. They're very good at just being beige and normal, but actually these birds are fabulous and easily overlooked. Um, and there's lots that we can learn about those birds as well. All part of what I call a, a summer experience on the moor. Uh, they're, 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 they're omnipresent. And actually, they're not just a summer experience, but I like to think of watching them feeding their young um, on the granite boulders. Now, in more recent years, uh, not many people know this, but um, um, I worked um, as a field officer for the RSPB, uh, working on another Dartmoor resident and probably one of my favourite birds, uh, even before this, this work started. Um, and this is me in my office. I would do this every single day. Um, and I am watching out for ring oozle. Um, not many of them. This is one of the birds that we coloured ringed um, along with the BTO. So we could recognise them. This is a. Um, this is actually a, um, a very well. Actually, looks like it's a female, but with a very um, a very bright bill. Um, they are beautiful. The male has um, has a much brighter um, gorget. That's the ring of white around its chest, um, and it is also known as the mountain blackbird. In fact, the blackbird is its nearest relative, um, and there is uh, the female again. You can see the brown. Um, she's actually collecting food for the nest. The colour rings, by the way, help us identify individuals without having to catch them again, because with just the little metal ring, which you can just see uh, under the blue ring there, uh, the details aren't clear enough. Um, and that is a male um, looking rather splendid. It's such a brilliant bird. Its, sound, its song, its sound is, it's the beating heart of a wild upland for me. And uh, they're declining everywhere. We, we have the most southerly population of ring oozles um, in the UK. Um, and we're down to a handful of pairs now, uh, but they're clinging on and hopefully um, we can reverse that, uh, that decline. But uh, there is a possibility we'll see those if you if you're, uh, visit Dartmoor at the right season. This is the sort of place they might nest, a uh, traditional site here on one of the tours. They like nesting all these little crevices um, and there's the nest below, just like a blackbird's nest. Um, wonderful, wonderful birds. Um, another famous habitat on the moor is the, the other little bogs and mires. Roast pasture, which is a Welsh word, I think it means red, um, is, is what it calls these are flower rich, um, incredibly important biodiverse areas. Many of them were drained because they're, they're not much good for anything else. Um, you can graze them and they're very succulent, but uh, uh, lots of these were drained because they're in the rich valley floors. But uh, um, a habitat for a couple of crackers, the only site in the UK for the bog hoverfly, that's the middle insect there, and also the narrow bordered bee hawk moth can be found in these pastures. But anyway, they're just a nice place to go. Lots of bright coloured sphagnum moss, that's that squishy moss that forms those hummocks. They'll be, um, uh, and, and, oh, I don't know why that slides in there. Uh, lots of orchids, lots of uh, marsh orchids and spotted orchids and all the hybrids in between. There's um, uh, butterwort, there's the, you know, the pinguicula, which is a carnivorous plant, 
Uh, that's one that's not flowering yet. You can see the flower coming up in the middle, but uh, their leaves are covered in glandular hairs. If an insect lands on the leaf, it rolls up slowly like a rolling carpet of death um, and digests the insects and gets the valuable nitrogen from their bodies, the nitrogen that isn't uh, available for plant growth in the soil. Uh, we've equally got a couple of species of sundew. In fact, I think we've got all three species of sundew here as well. Uh, again, here's one sticking out of a, um, a, a clump of sphagnum. Um, and this is another one of the weird hoverflies. This is one um, that I've been trying to find the, cat the larvae of. This is Microdon, cute little thing, uh, but underneath that cute exterior um, is, is a life cycle which is, which is pretty murderous really if you're an ant because they, their larvae look like um, big rubbery frisbees. Um, when I say big, they're only a couple of millimetres across, but they're, they're big for ants and they sit there and they parasitise the brood of, um, of the ants uh, that, uh, that are found in the rose pasture as well. So um, I'll be looking out for those anyway. And I'm also, I mean, again, it's not a real Dartmoor specialist, but I've got a little project. So if you did visit um, in the summer months, I may well take you um, and show you my, not that I'm a church goer, and please don't judge me if, if you are, but um, I see churches as very, very good bird boxes. So uh, along with our vicar there, who's very much up for this sort of thing, that's Paul, by the way, um, we will be, uh, we put nest boxes behind the louvers in the church um, the last few years, and we have uh, swift project we have cameras on the nests you can go into the church and see the swift chicks developing um so yeah Ooh. oh gosh that, that's the moment yourself jump there um so there we are that's, that's some of my babies from a couple of years ago um i'm not i wouldn't be able to take you up the church tower that'd be silly but um um i can certainly share with you the uh, the stories the successes and the things that uh, you can do and if you're lucky i might even show you a swift fly and uh, again, don't judge me. These things are just as fascinating as the Swifts themselves. If you want to know more, they ask questions at the end. Oh, are we at that point? Um, any questions? I've got loads more I could talk to you about, but I didn't want to, um, I'm aware that uh, I've been going for plenty of time now. So um, um, I just thought I'd, uh, I'd, um, I'd end it there. And um, I think you've got a sense of what I'm about really and why I like Dartmoor. And there's many, you know, it's many, it's many more facets than that. Um, but there's only so much you can fit into what I was told should be a half hour talk. I think I've gone on for a lot longer than that, so I'll shut up now. Um, Nick, did you actually breathe at all in the course of the last 45 minutes? Oh, it was amazing. I'm doing that now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm out of breath. <laughs> Fantastic. Crikey. I, um, yeah, I don't, don't, don't know where to start. Good gracious. <laughs> uh, okay. Here we go. I've got I've got oodles of questions to ask you, um, which is lovely. Um, so I think it's probably worth saying to uh, to the good people on this on this presentation that um, that you're leading. Uh, there's a number of trips um, over the summer, which which at the moment, of course, are uh, well. We're talking talking June time, aren't we? Um, and uh, for the time being, at least May uh, in the May and June. Um, the very first question I'm going to ask you is from Michael, uh, who has asked about the walk between Newbridge and Dartmeet. Yes. Um, and uh, basically asking what the walk is like, asking a bit about the terrain, fitness level, requirement, etc, etc. Okay, um, it's quite a difficult one to judge that because obviously it, it, people uh, perceive their own fitness in different ways. I've, I've done many trips where people think they're superhuman and they realise that they won't get to the top of the mountain after all. But um, so it's very difficult. I find it easy, but then I'm, I guess I'm fairly able. It's a little bit lumpy. Um, there are some um, uh, some ups and downs. There are some, some slightly rockier sections. It's not like rock climbing. You don't need crampons or anything, but it is... Um, <sighs> Yeah, it's a stout boot walk, um, and we'd never be rushing. If that's a, if if, if no. you're asking because you want to come along on it, um, we will never be rushing because if anyone's ever gone for a walk with me, just like I talk really fast and go and, and can talk for England, um, I walk very slow. So uh, I walk as slow as I as I speak fast, if that makes sense. Uh, because there's always so much to see. So uh, you'll never, ever feel that you are. The, I'll be the slowest one in the bunch. I'll be leading from the back, as always. Um, but um, but if you're worried about it, the other thing with these trips are we're, we're, we're very inclusive. We can potentially um, customise days around people's abilities. We could drop people off in different places and meet them later or put them onto something else and meet them at the other place. You know, so there's lots of ways around. 
um, any of these problems. So don't worry about it too much, but it's not, it's quite, I'm trying to think how long the walk is now. Again, it's very difficult for me to judge distance because it, so, it takes me so long, but it's worth doing because it takes you, if you can, it takes you through uh, classic, some classic butterfly sites. You walk up one of the most beautiful rivers uh, in England, in my, my view. Um, you'll see, you'll see fish, you'll see goosander. You might even see a mandarin duck or two. Um, there's a small <laughs> naturalized population. You certainly see sign of otter um, uh, and maybe you'll see otter, very unlikely, but it's possible. Um, and of course, you've got the big hanging oak woodlands there, which are on a good summer's day, all the clearings are full of woodland butterflies um, and, and, and it's buzzing with life. So uh, it's worth doing and we would do it very slowly. But um, but yeah, it's it's a little bit lumpy in places. Um, uh, but what I will do, I've, I've got to do it. I've got to do it very soon because my daughter's doing a, a fundraiser at the moment where we're trying to top all of Dartmoor's tours. Um, oh. so I will have to do the Dart Valley very, very soon so I can I can keep that question in my head and and re recce it if that makes sense and go and have a look and report that'd be back. great yeah that that would be great so 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 actually that leads quite neatly on to on to the next question um which is that um it would be good to know what uh and i don't suppose there is such a thing in a sense but it'd be good to know what sort of a standard day is like um <laughs> On our Dartmoor trip. Now, try and answer that one in two sentences. I bet you can't. Um, is it early starts, late finishes? Um, no time for lunch, obviously, because everyone's <laughs> looking at exciting things and taking. Well, I don't, you're more likely to get lunch than you are any of the other meals, I think. No, oh, yeah, um, what it is is um, obviously we appreciate it is a holiday. Uh, it's a break, so we're not. Um, it's not a, a military drill. We're not going to. Uh, again, if it's if it's a one if it's early in the year. We might get up on one of the days and, and do a dawn chorus. Um, um, and it's the best time of the day for all sorts of things. So, you know, if you want to see Lesser Spotted Woodpecker, for example, uh, yeah. getting up earlier or at least having breakfast early enough to get you out um, um, at a reasonable time, um, you might like to see stuff. But, um, but again, a lot of the things, if it's in the summer, a lot of the sun loving stuff don't get, doesn't get going until the, the ground warms up. So, um, so yeah, I wouldn't, and we're customised, again, we customise it, because of course the weather can change. We can get all four seasons in a day. Yeah. I don't want to put you off. I mean, it is, that's the reality. So I've got to put a reality filter on things. So, so often we might set off, we might have a plan, but we might have to swap it or change it or, 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 or adjust it in some way to take into account the, um, the, the weather conditions. So you're right, there isn't really a standard day, but I would want to try and get the most out of the day if, if possible, because okay, it's an excuse for me to do what I like doing as well. So, um, but equally, you know, the places we're staying, have got a lot of character. You don't have to, if, you, if, you're, if we've worn you out, um, then um, you, you can, uh, you, there's not, you don't have to do all the activities. I mean, you can, you know, we can arrange for you to be um, just drinking beer at the bar in the, in the, uh, in the hotel. You know, that's absolutely fine. Uh, you just have to be strong enough to deal with the stories of what we saw when we got back. You know, that's the, that's the reality. But, um, but you know, things like, um, you know, blue ground beetle, for example, if we're, if it's that time of the year for those, then we might be out until, you know, late ish. Um, if I decide I want to run a moth trap, and I think we should, um, then it's actually more fun to be doing the moth trap live in the night yeah. than it is mm -hmm. to be looking at it in the morning. We of course can do the thing in the morning, yeah. but actually they, they, it's really nice to be out at night. We ne none of us really do it enough. None of us are active after dark enough. We, we tend to put the telly on or, or, or go to bed. So it's quite nice to actually spend some time in the evening drinking in the sights and the sounds and the smells of of that wonderful sort of twilight uh, um, world, that uh, that 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 time of transition between the, the 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 day and the night, and there's all the mysteries and all the all the wonderful things that go on there. It's a magical time. So I'd like you to experience that as well. And because the groups are relatively small, um, it should be uh, something that's uh, achievable with uh, with the size of the group. So we probably can do just time just sitting there and just taking in a view, you know. It always seems a great shame, doesn't it, to um, to, to end a day um, when there's still probably so much more that can that can be done and seen and watched and explored and photographed and recorded and you know whatever else. It, it, they can go on forever and ever and ever. It's just fantastic. You wear yourself out very quickly. I like to pace it a little bit, but equally I realise it's your trip. So ultimately, um, you know, we'll put stuff on, 
Um, but usually you, you, yeah, I will just keep going. If, you, if, the, if you're interested enough, I will keep finding things for you to be interested in. So it's one of those things I'm more likely to break uh, before you are. <laughs> um, okay, so a so couple of other questions. No, actually, before a couple of other questions, I'm just going to read you out um, one of the chat messages um, which came in a couple of seconds ago. What a fantastic talk. A wildlife worldwide trip to Dartmoor is on our list now. Um, that's quite nice. Thank you very much um, you. Uh, uh, to, to Dick and Jill for, for posting that. Um, Nick, tell me about uh, the possibility of seeing raptors. They are right at the top of my personal list, but one or two other people have asked the same sort of thing. Raptors being one, and actually someone else has asked about nightjars. What's okay, well, the likelihood? Nightjars, no problem. Assuming with it, again, it all depends on, you know, uh, from uh, night jars will be calling from May, uh, late May, June, all the way through. I mean, you can hear them into July, uh, end yeah. of July, August. Um, but on but our dates, it's looking. I mean, our dates yeah. are, are, are May, June, so so we yeah. should. Yeah. So, so night jars, uh, uh, almost certainly, if we get the weather right, that's uh, almost certain. Um, as for raptors, uh, we have obviously buzzards are going to be everywhere, um, and buzzards are going to very overlooked raptor um but uh, they're, they're always up to something really interesting uh we will certainly be the, so the, um there'll be nests in uh, we should get buzzard nests so we might see some feeding activity we might well see uh might see some fledging depends on which which trip we, we uh, you come on um so that's a dead sir there's certainly there's, there's always the chance of goshawk um I know a couple of territories that we can hang out at or around. That's uh, so loads of kestrel because, again, there's lots of small mammals up there as well. You mentioned uh, hobby, of course, during the course. Hobby, of your... yeah, hobby are quite common actually because we've got really good dragonflies. So that's a good sort of mid to late summer species. Yeah. Uh, they love the dragonflies. They like the emperor early on in the season, and, and the bumblebees as well. They eat a lot of bumblebees. But those roast pasture I was telling you about are really good places for dragonflies. And of course, a roast pasture without a hobby. Um, in in the height of summer is uh, it's not a roast pasture at all. So there's you know you, you always like it's a hobby quite a common sight actually. Um, we've had some exotics as well. So I think goshawk, sparrowhawk, uh, kestrel, um, buzzard, uh, red kite is a possibility. They fly over a lot. They don't breed here yet, but we see them over quite a lot. Um, that's good enough, isn't it? That's quite a few. There are honey buzzards as well in some locations, but they're they're really difficult to see and really rare. So very unlikely to see those if I'm if if, if I'm truthful. But you never know. You never know. Stranger things have happened. Um, so uh, another bird oh, question for oh, you. And in the winter, sorry. Um, uh, we also have uh, hen harrier roosts in the winter as well. We, we might need to be setting up some winter trips, Nick. And yeah, we might also see a merlin or two as well. So there's there's possibilities for those in the later. Uh, later windows of opportunity anyway. Um, so another bird question for you uh, from someone from from Richard who says why do dippers dip? That was one of the questions that came in early when you showed a photograph of your dipper. Ah, uh, so really good. Um, good, a good question. Uh, the honest answer is nobody really knows. Uh, my favourite theory, but I think it's nonsense, is um, is that it's what's called physical camouflage. So if you notice lots of birds uh, that live near fast flowing water. Uh, think of wagtails, uh, dippers, uh, common sandpiper, they all dip and bob. Um, and if you are dipping and bobbing against a background that's also moving around, you're less visible. That's one theory. Yeah. Um, we suspect it's a social thing. It's a way, it's, we suspect it's a way of visually um, uh, communicating with each other. It's like a contact call without making any noise, uh, mainly because they're quite open habitats that they yeah. find, find themselves in. So. Um, I don't know. Um, it's fascinating. It's one of those many mysteries of the natural world that you can speculate. It's the sort of thing you can sit and speculate about um, over a, a Carabas gin and tonic or a, or a, or a fine local Dartmoor beer. <laughs> well, that sounds like an excellent idea. Wouldn't it be nice to go into a pub now and have a Dartmoor oh, beer? Oh, it, yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, then uh, one final question for you, Nick. I'm, I'm, I'm very conscious of everybody's time. What time is it? It's approaching quarter to nine. I'm very conscious of everyone's time. Um, your photographs are absolutely outstanding on that. They, they just absolutely brilliant. Um, 
during the course of uh, 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 one of these um, two or three day breaks, three day breaks, um, do you offer photographic tips and advice? Do you take your camera? Is it yeah. other good tips for photographers? Would you say? I would take I would take my camera. I always help people out as best I can. I mean, I'm not the I'm not the best. Um, I'm a, well. I'm learning myself, so you know we can learn together. I'm I'm better with my macro in the sense of that's why there's not that many bird pictures because I have to borrow a long lens of somebody to get a good bird picture, and and um, I also. I also am one of those people that I'm because so, I'm, I'm into everything. It's a bit of a curse, actually, because um, whereas if you're into birds, you just take one bird lens, you take a nice long lens. And if you're into bugs, you take your macro and that's that. But if you're into both, that's that's double the amount of kit. And it's very easy to get so bogged down in equipment that you forget to experience the experience. Yeah. And um, and I know what you and I know, you know what I'm talking about, because it is a bit of a sometimes it's nice to go right today, whatever the weather. I'm not taking the camera. I'm just going to go for yeah. the memory. I'm going to try. Because the thing is, there's this great idea that, oh, I'm catching that. I'm looking through the camera and I'll keep that because that's a memory. That is, that's my justification for taking this thing with you. Yeah. But the actual reality is the exact moment that you've recorded on in your, in your camera, by definition of how a camera works, is the one moment you're not seeing because the yeah. shadows yeah. come yeah. down. Yeah. So, yeah. So it's one of those things where actually it's quite nice sometimes to just put it down and have a bit of camera discipline. But I'll, of course, I'll help you out best I can. Um, often what happens, uh, and the irony of this is, I show people how to take pictures and they take better pictures than me. <laughs> <laughs> Not that it bothers me, that's always a good thing. But, uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm happy to give tips where I can. That's the best way. Nick, that is absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, Goodness, I'm gonna to have to lie down. I can't, I'm not sure if I can keep up. I won't be able to go away with you again, Nick. I'll never be able to keep up. Um, but I can give you a good challenge on a bicycle. I'm sure you certainly can. can. Yeah, you can. Um, you can give me run for money on two wheels. Um, <laughs> so, uh, look to to everybody who has joined us this evening. Thank you very, very much indeed. Actually, Nick, may I ask you to put that final slide up oh, yes yeah, sorry yes that's uh, that's not very really professional um, yeah, that's the most important. no no that's very professional because uh, i didn't ask you so so, so now i now i do um so there are a number of other questions that have come on come come over to me on chat which um i'll be able to get back to to some of you guys um over the course of the next uh next uh, few days um and uh there's a number of people asking about trips which of course is very exciting um, a number of questions there just isn't time uh, to ask Nick so so apologies for that what I will say to to those of you that that are remaining on the on the um, uh, that, that are still with us on this on this zoom presentation if you want to join Nick um, uh, one of the trips that uh, that Nick is doing next year with us is the Festival of British Wildlife um, which is in Agas up in Scotland um, Nick will be there together with um, another great pal of ours and a great pal of Nick's as well, Nick Garbutt. Um, um, Mike Dilger will also be there. Mike is doing the talk on Thursday, um, another pal of Nick's. Um, and also Alex Hyde, who is a, another great naturalist and a, and a wonderful wildlife photographer as well. So maybe worth asking us about that. Um, with that, Nick, I, I'm going to have to go and find a beer in the fridge or a, or, or, or something. <laughs> Sorry about that. I do, <laughs> do. I do get excited. You see, that's the problem. <laughs> I've had so, so many comments saying what what a wonderful, exciting, um, breathless uh, experience the last hour and a half has been, or whatever it is. Um, Nick, thank you so much. Um, thank you everybody for joining us on this presentation you know how much we uh, we love having you on board um and how grateful we are to you uh for uh, taking the time to spend it with us thank you so much nick thanks that was outstanding thank you and thanks thank you. to everyone for uh, as well my, my thanks to you all for joining us and, and as long as there's not hundreds of questions chris you can always ping them on and i'll get around to answering them by the end of the week as well i can send you the answers and you can get back to folk but uh, uh, only if it's not hundreds, because I've got <laughs> okay, but ninety-nine. I've got a few. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, Nick. Thank you so All much. Right. Good night, everyone. See, right. See you, Chris. Bye.